Hello and welcome to Shattered Lives, Reach Ireland's crime podcast. I'm Paul Healy. I'm crime correspondent for the Irish Daily Star and Irish Mirror newspapers. And I'm joined as ever by Michael O'Toole, our crime and defence editor, who is joining us today from Cavan. How's it going, Michael? Greetings. Hello, Paul. Greetings from sunny Ballyconnell. <laughs> and tell us, t- t- tell our listeners what you're doing down there. You're at the PD4 conference, is that right? Yes, so at the PD4, so that's the Permanent Defence Forces Other Ranks Representative Association. Defence Forces and Guardi, as you'll know, can't have unions, but they can have a representative associations. So there are two main associations in the Defence Forces. There's RACO, which is for commissioned officers, so lieutenant all the way up. And then there's PD4, so that's for other ranks, essentially, privates, corporals, sergeants, uh, staff sergeants, company sergeants, all that sort of stuff. So they're having their conference here today. Now, the main issue, there are plenty of issues there, you know, like all organi- workplace organizations that have their problems. But the real, I suppose, the real news story from today should be announced in the next 45 minutes. And that's about Lieutenant General Sean Clancy, who's the Defence Forces Chief of Staff. He has been nominated by the the government to head the Europe, European Union's military committee. So that is basically a, a, the the main military advisor to the European Union. So he's in for it. The meeting is taking place as we speak. I think the vote is at three o'clock. So in, in the next few minutes, and then there'll be a private conclave for about half an hour, and it should be announced at half three. Quarter to four, uh, Tanis Chen, Minister, Minister for Defence, Michal Martin, is going to be here and he's expected to announce it. Now, reading the runes, there are very strong indications he's going to get it. So if he gets it, it's a three year gig. Uh, he'll be the top military advisor for the EU, essentially, and he'll have to wow. leave his position as Defence Forces Chief of Staff. So the, we will be looking for uh, another Chief of Staff. So it's a very big gig if he gets it, and he will be the first Irish officer ever to hold that position. So it's a real international story for the Defence mm-hmm. Forces. And he's, he's he's a highly experienced officer, obviously. So he's he's more than qualified for the job. Yeah, he was. He's I think he's the first Air Corps pilot to to hold the chief of staff position, and he, he's awarded for his bravery. He took part in a lot of you know air sea rescue missions and that sort of stuff. So very very well regarded, very good communicator. So uh, we'll see what happens in the next hour. Or so very interesting. Um, there were quite a number of things that happened this week, but you were across the um, a terrible tragedy there. Um, in the County Loud area last week, and there was a development again this week with the uh, the very sad death of of Patricia Muckian. Yes, so uh, she was known as Pat uh, Muckian, uh, eighty one year old lady, very well known in Dundalk. She had been in, centrally involved in the credit union for years. I think she actually helped set it up in the time. Very very well regarded. Now it's before the courts, so obviously we're we're tied as to what we can say, but uh, she was injured in an incident in Dundalk last Friday week. Uh, three women were injured and she passed away from her injuries on Monday. Now, Nicholas Muckin, who's 47 and has an address in Glenwood Estate in Dundalk, he is currently before the courts. He is charged with three counts of assault causing harm, including to uh, at Muckian. He has been remanded in custody. He will appear in court again on the 5th of June. He also faces one charge of uh, unlawfully intimidating someone with a hatchet. So as I said, 5th of June, and he is charged with four counts for offences. The other incident we want to discuss is um, the tragedy that happened in Salins in County Kildare over the weekend. Um, on, on Sunday, uh, the early hours of Sunday morning, we heard about this incident that had happened out in Salins Park, uh, the, the Salins Park estate in Salins. Um, so at the early hours of the morning, Gardy were called to a property there at around 3 a.m. Uh, and the, a man's body was discovered there at the back of the property. And he was subsequently identified as a, a Moldovan national, um, but had been living in this country for some time. And his name is, uh, I'm going to probably mispronounce this, but he was known as John, so I- I- Ian Daggy. Uh, is his is his name? He's a thirty nine year old father of three, and he was a roofer. Uh, I found out. Um, so I went out to the scene on 
uh, Monday morning um, and uh, sorry, Sunday morning. Um, and uh, I was I was there and just gathering information. Um, and a lot of the neighbours knew Mr. Daggy and said he was a very friendly individual. And um, they, they knew his children in particular. His children played with the other children on the street. It's a very nice estate, like, a, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a lovely little cul-de-sac up there just outside of Salance um, town. And and the, the area was just completely shocked by the incident. So, um, Gardy, uh, they've subsequently launched a, a murder investigation and there is now a man before the courts. Uh, his name is Valerio Melnick. He has an address in Calixtown in in uh, in Ratcool, and he was charged with Mr. Daggy's murder um, at the address in Salance. So he appeared at a late night court appearance actually on Monday night um, at 11 o'clock at night and he was formally charged with the murder and he's due back in court actually uh, later this week. So just in terms of um the this particular tragedy, you know, we we like every tragedy we cover, we try to establish a little bit about the victim. And um I spoke to a couple of friends of Mr. Daggy who worked with him in the roofing uh business and they said he was a a, a gentleman, a, a lovely person, and issued me with a photograph of him. Um and we published that in our paper and subsequently uh, managed to get in contact with Mr. Daggy's wife. So we have an interview in today's Mirror and Star uh, with Mr. Daggy's wife, Angelina. Um, naturally, you, you know, she is quite distraught and upset, but she had a couple of things that she basically wanted to say. Um, and, and so you can you can read that interview today, but she said he was essentially the rock of the family and 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 that she now has to uh, go on living her life trying to raise their three children. Um, so very difficult uh, time for that family. This, this may be a silly question, and we're, I suppose we're at, I supposed to ask silly questions to get the answers. Hi, oh, how was she? Well, I, look, I, I spoke to her, um, you know, uh, Moldovan, uh, sorry, she's from Mold, Mold, Moldova. Uh, Romanian. So uh, uh, our conversation was was uh, conducted uh, in, in a kind of a Google Translate sort of uh, situation, but she understood that I was using that and we mm -hmm. uh, we communicated as, as best we could through that. Um, it's the technology is fantastic now. So, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I it's not that I just took the first sentence and ran with it. We, we made sure that I understood what she was saying and vice versa. She understood what I was saying. Um, it's incredible because otherwise I think we probably wouldn't have been able to conduct the interview. But um, she just said that uh, she, there's three children left without a father. Um, she described her husband as kind and gentle at heart. He loves his children a lot. He, um, we lived an amazing life with him. When he came back from work, he was always very happy to see us. He was our support. Um, he was my shelter. We loved each other a lot, but we were also best friends. He was honest, strong and loyal. Just speaking generally, are you ever surprised that uh, loved ones do talk to the media in the way they do? Yes, because we we are used to getting a bit of grief, and understandably mm. so. You know, families are grieving and they're going through a very difficult time, and maybe the last thing they want, well, I'm sure the last thing they want is to be contacted by the likes of us, uh, particularly the knock at the door, which you know we call in the industry maybe callously so, a death knock, but that's what it is. You knock on the door and you're asking a family who have just lost their loved one um, how they feel. Um, and more times than not, we're told where to go and uh, sometimes even, you know, um, aggressively so. But families are upset, but everyone takes these things differently, you know, and some families even, um, I know in this case, Mr. Jaggi's wife, uh, wanted to be contacted and, um, um, you know, I, I think ultimately was grateful that she was. That's not always the case, but, um, you know, that's why we make the contact. Uh, in this case, it was over social media, um, but she was very grateful and she supplied me with a photograph of her and her husband that she would prefer us to use. And it's a lovely tribute to him. Uh, and, and, and some people might not understand this, but for people to talk, somebody has to approach them. In other words, they don't magic themselves to the star, the mirror or whatever. So it, we have to approach people. But I got a greater understanding of why some people do talk after the death of my own father. He died of a heart, God love him. He's only 66. He died of a heart attack in 2001. He was, uh, and he was on holiday with my mommy in Tunisia. And, right. 
I can remember, and it was a nightmare getting this body home, God love him, but I can remember when it happened, all I wanted to do was talk about it. Now, other people didn't, but I did. And that's always stuck stuck with me. And it gave me an understanding why some loved ones of victims do talk. I I suppose it's cathartic for some people and it, mm. it means something, you know, and as this is something that I I suppose I said to Mr. Jaggi's wife and that I say to to most people I'd write to interview, you know, a person is more than a statistic and they deserve mm. to be remembered. Um in this case, Mr. Jaggi um lost his life in an alleged murder. Uh it's something that's going to be all over the papers and has been all over the papers. And would you rather have your loved one, their picture be shown in the newspaper and to actually have someone talk about them and who they were and and you know, they're a human being and they deserve to be remembered. And I think that's some people really appreciate that. Yeah. And I think you know what I say to people as well, everybody has a story. And do you want to tell that person's story? Because you're quite right. Otherwise, it will just be however many paragraphs or whatever in a newspaper. Yeah. But if the and I know it's hard for them, but if the loved one does talk, that person's story, what you said about the the parent, Mr. Daggy, always smiling, coming home with his kids. Only a loved one can give that level of detail. Yeah. It personifies it, I think, because <laughs> I think otherwise people read it and move on and they kind of go mm. well that you know, and, and assumptions are even made about mm. what happened um now look i i can't go into the detail of of what's alleged to have happened here because someone is now before the courts but you know it is going to end up in the media again it is going to end up in the courts and so the family have been able to have their say at least in terms of sharing their memories of mr doggy and who he was and i think that goes a long way for the family and for the friends, for the people who knew them, you know? And so that's, I suppose, maybe the least we can do is to make that contact and to give them that opportunity um, at a very hard time. And just one technical point, uh, the accused was remanded in custody and listeners and viewers will know that when it's a murder charge, the district court does not have the authority or power to deal with matters of bail. So yes. if there is a bail application, there may or may not be, but it will have to be in the high court. So when you're charged with murder, in Ireland, it's always at the district court level and you're always remanded in custody. Yes. Shall we talk about the, the latest development in the, the never-ending Kinahan cartel saga? What is happening, Hilly? <laughs> well, uh, this is a great uh, investigation um, uh, with a consortium, international consortium of media uh, across the world, including the uh, the involvement of the Irish Times and, of course, the Times Ireland as well. Um, it's the Dubai Unlocked investigation. So it's it's looking into um, the individuals all over the world and their property interests within the United Arab Emirates. And, of course, they have looked at Daniel Kinahan, Christy Kinahan, and, and the, 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 their associates. And we, we've learned just some interesting things about their activities. We're learning a, there's an awful lot of information mm. suddenly coming from Dubai where, where we were learning nothing about them for the past maybe six or seven years. Um, but this investigation has um, revealed that uh, properties were bought uh, under the name of Daniel Kinahan's wife, uh, Kiva Robinson, um, and they, they're, they're, they're worth quite a, a serious sum of money. So there were six, at least six properties purchased by the Kinahans since they moved to Dubai in 2015. And um, they include a villa in the Emirates Hills, which was bought for six point. Uh, Six point uh, six million, sorry, and it was sold then apparently the following year for eleven point seven million. Um, I suppose what's interesting about this investigation is most of these properties have now been sold, and so the the Irish Times are saying this investigation is showing that subsequent to the um the now infamous sanctions that were brought in by the United States and the United Arab Emirates governments, uh, the Kinahans appear to have sold most of these properties that they purchased seemingly at a profit as well. So they're making money. Um, how do we read into that? Are they selling these properties because of the sanctions and they're looking to get out of Dubai? Well, as far as we know, they're still in Dubai. But what do you make of it? Well, there's a couple of points. Reading Conor Gallagher's report, if I've read it properly, they have bought at least one property since the sanctions were imposed on them. Mm. So that's a bit of a glitch. I always say this, Paul, we sometimes work as journalists, we're fumbling in the dark. And just before we come on, we were talking about this and, you know, I interviewed at AGSI, the Association of Guard of Sergeants and Inspectors, we interviewed Helen McEntee and, and uh, 
Garda Commissioner Joey Harris, and they were both bullishly confident about, you know, that there, there are plans, there's an effort to get an extradition treaty so they can get Daniel Kennan back, mm-hmm. Sean McGovern back, and maybe Christy and uh, Christy Senior and Christopher Junior back to Ireland. So there has to be a deal. And we're sitting there going, right, and we said this a couple of weeks ago, the sanctions were imposed in April 2022. It's now May 2024. A long time, but maybe that confidence that Miss McEntee and Commissioner Harris have is because they know more than us. Mm-hmm. In other words, they know stuff that is happening that we don't. Mm-hmm. So maybe there are the wheels are moving slowly, but perhaps they are moving the way that the Irish authorities want them to. Perhaps so, but I would also say, you know, when you're dealing with that kind of money that the Kinnahans have and they're investing it in properties, this is nothing new. I mean, Christy Kinnahan Sr. has plenty of investments in properties across Spain over the years and then went on to sell them for a profit. That's what they're doing. They're washing their money Mm -hmm. through properties and then they're also selling them for clearly a profit. It's maybe not indicative that they're looking to leave Dubai and it's just showing that it's business as usual, perhaps, for them. Another thing that struck me about it, I saw, I totted up the profit they made from the property sales. Mm. It was maybe six million, seven million, something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Compared to the their assets of about one and a half billion, it's chicken feed, really. I mean, these yes. guys are billionaires. It's a billionaire billion euro business, mm-hmm. at least. It's fascinating, though, to see the 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 areas that they are result well, whether they're actually living in these properties. I don't know, but I'm, I'm just going to read out some more of the investigation here. There was a six-bedroom villa in Parkway Vistas, also in Kiva Robinson's name, sold for $5.2 million in 2022. Uh, a luxury apartment in the elite residence skyscraper went for $1 million. Um, and and that, uh, there, there was an office also used by, by Daniel Kinahan, which apparently was, in, was caught up in all of this. So <laughs> I... It, Okay, you're saying maybe small potatoes, but it does show you their vast wealth that they're purchasing multiple properties, I suppose. Um, uh, again, I think it's indicative of business as usual, but that's just my two cents. Um, but there's there's no sign that they have left Dubai, whether they feel comfortable in Dubai or perhaps there are other impediments maybe preventing them currently from leaving Dubai. We don't know. Some people have said, can they go anywhere? I think mm. they can. I think they mm. can go to Russia, no problem. You know, they could go to some maybe Southeast Asian state. Wouldn't be a bother on them, but they could definitely go to Russia and de- and Russia would definitely not kick those fellas out. No, uh, you have to wonder. I mean, do they have friends in high places in Dubai or or or, or is it is it simply, or you're saying perhaps they it doesn't appear to be the case that they can't go elsewhere. Um, I, I've, I've often wondered when not being able to get a satisfactory answer since the UAE sanctioned the Kinahans and supposedly froze bank accounts. What was the outcome of that? Well, we're seeing mm. that they're still selling properties as of 2022. So did it really have an impact? What kind of assets were frozen? We got a lot of information from the Americans, um, but the UAE stated that they sanctioned and froze bank accounts, but we actually really don't know what they actually remember- sanctioned them for. I remember, I think we spoke about this at the time of the sanctions. No family members were sanctioned. I, remember, I think I raised that with you. Well, look, you know, it's okay that their partners can just have the money and have the cash and have the bank cards and do all that sort of stuff. And that, there'd be an indicate, very strong indication that that's what's happening. Yeah, an interesting thing that's come out in this investigation is uh, the involvement of associates like Ian Duck. Uh, sorry, mm. Ian, Ian Dixon, who is, I think, a relative or a cousin of Daniel Kinahan and a good friend. Um, and, it, it, you know, he was also sanctioned by the US, but he apparently paid 3000 a month for a property that, that was then purchased by, under the name of, anyway, Kiva Robinson. Interesting that Kinahan won't put his own name to these things. Mm-hmm. That's telling of something as well, isn't it? I, I also thought it was interesting that they don't appear to be, uh, to have any property that they live in. Mm. So they, they have lots of property, but there's no property registered to them that they are domiciled in. So they must be renting somewhere or they must be renting off the books, which well, is even, another quirky thing. Even the address that was, you know, uh, publicized by the Americans for Daniel Kinnan, I, I think we've now learned uh, that he's not even living there anymore. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. Paul, do, do, you remember, do you remember when the sanctions first hit and you and I and Mick O'Neill went over to Spain? 
the doorstep, the fella, the house that was listed as an address for, for Christopher. How, how could I forget it? <laughs> and it was some poor solicitor or lawyer who had been living mm. there for 15 years and he hadn't got a clue what we were talking about. So obviously some things already did. Can that's, I tell you what my theory is? Go on. Years ago, in a trial in Limerick, the McCarthy Dundon gang, one of them said, for every action, there's a reaction, right? And I yeah. think that this story, this uh, group of journalists, for a play to them, there are going to be consequences for that story, and I'll tell you why. Reading it, it was, I, I read the story in the Times of London today as well, and it was more about Dubai, Dubai, being a haven for international gangsters. The mm -hmm. Irish Times, obviously, and naturally concentrated on Kinnan, but the, the big story from a world perspective was that uh, Dubai is a, a lovely place for gangsters to live and to spend mm. their money. Mm. And I wonder, will the Dubai government or the UAE government go, fuck this? Not a good look. It's not a good look. And I mm -hmm. think that's what the reaction will be. Yeah, well, then that hopefully helps the cause of getting the Kinnahans home, doesn't it? <laughs> we'll see I, I, what happens. I, you know, I mean, when you think about it, like this this piece of information, this data dump came from a, a an NGO or a, a non-profit in America, in Washington, right? Mm. So, you know, it's different gravy, really. It's not two fellas from the Star of the Mirror talking to each other in Dublin. This mm. is a global level. So naturally, the UAE government will be under serious pressure about this. And there, I think there will be consequences. Hopefully. So it's fantastic to see journalists working together internationally mm. like that and being able to, to to do investigations we've not seen the likes of before. I mean, we, we've already seen uh, multiple investigations uh, conducted with the Sunday Times, for example, um, you know, and we've we've learned a fascinating amount about Christy Kinahan in particular uh, and the kind of circles that he's uh, running in. So who knows what's going to come out in the next six months? And, and an interesting aspect of that is it's good to see the marriage of good old fashioned journalism and mm. technological experts. So mm -hmm. gumshoe hacks and geeks, really. They're coming together and it's a perfect marriage. So the the the, the nerds can find the information and the journalists can contextualize it and explain it. Yeah, because uh, even just on those food reviews that uh, Christy Kinahan left, I mean, uh, I saw some, you know, social media commentary of people going, sure anyone could have found that if you were yeah. looking. And it, 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 they were not easy to find. It's not that you could just type in Christy Kinahan and find them that easily. I mean, it, it did require genuine technical skills to actually track down and find his profile and to be able to verify that it was him. Um, like proper work and investigation went into it. And the technical skills needed to be able to verify some of those things, um, even to be able to get that uh, the, that that website uh, uh, that once existed with full of propaganda to even be able to link that back to Christy Kinahan took some technical skills. I I know there's a kind of a theory that Kinahan nearly wanted to be found and that this was nearly a ploy. If that's the case, he didn't make it very easy. That's all I would say. Yeah, and people will always sneer. People will always be hurlers on the ditch. Um, it's like Maeve Bin. She was, I remember she once said, somebody said to me about her books, oh, I could write that. And she said, well, why don't you? <laughs> so anybody can say I, that would have been easy to find, but he didn't, Sunshine. It took mm. Bellingcat to do it, really. It did, it did. Shall we talk about Stardust briefly? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and uh, this is one we can both maybe speak to because we, we both... Uh, over the last couple of weeks since uh, the the incredible uh, verdict um, in the Stardust inquest with a jury um, a historical decision found um, that all 48 victims were unlawfully killed, we have been trying to track down and speak to Eamon Butterley, the former uh, manager of the nightclub. Um, and he had effectively, we're going to use the term, gone to ground. Uh, we couldn't find Mr. Butterley at any of his addresses. And there were some indications possibly that he wasn't even in the country. <laughs> there were there were people uh, who gave another newspaper a bit of grief when they called to the door. And you were at the door as well. And there on Friday, we finally caught up with Mr. Butterley at his address. He wasn't interested in talking to us though, but uh, our photographer Mick O'Neill got some fantastic photographs of Mr. Butterley back at his, um, I would describe it as a plush Malahide home there. It's a gated uh, house. Yeah, I, was so. I was going to say, Paul, I, I, I didn't get to the door. I got to the gate. You got to the same. The buzzer. same. Very, yeah. 
can we call it a pile, a country pile? What's a pile? You know, a big, a big house, basically. A, a, well, I always said mansion, nearly, but it's a, it's yeah, a rather, it's... it's a rather large house. Yes, with yes. a nice bit of land. Uh, you know, quite close to Malahide. Um, I saw beautiful. chickens in the garden. Yes, chickens. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, but it's uh, as I'm sure we will speak to in a minute. It's not an easy house to uh, to stake out. We knew that Mr. Butterly, like many of the people that we try to speak to, are probably not going to speak to us or mm. want to speak to us or come to their door. Um, we got an indication. Uh, our, our colleague Robbie Kane got a tip off um, that Mr. Butterly was back at home, and so we went out on Friday, and it was a particularly hot day on Friday. Let me tell you. Um, and I knew he probably wasn't going to come to the door. As I said, the, you know, it's gated. And um, when you ring the buzzer, probably you get no answer or someone might talk through the buzzer, but you're highly unlikely to get a photograph of him. And with a story like this, I think the first photo of him since that that mm-hmm. particular verdict uh, means something. So we were trying to obviously get a photograph of him, myself and Mick O'Neill. We sat uh, in the proximity of the house, but not right outside the house for several hours in the hope that maybe Mr. Butterly would come out for a walk or we would be able to approach him in a public place, basically, effectively. Um, but there was no sign of any life whatsoever. Eventually, and, and it's a very difficult house to, you can speak to this, it's on kind mm-hmm. of a main road. You cannot just sit outside the front door in a car anyway. Uh, you'll be spotted straight away and you can but, speak but, to but, this. But even more important than that, I suppose, it would be dangerous to park there because there's there's no hard shoulder or there's, there was no verge. It was just a road. Um, so yeah. I, I remember uh, when I did the, the doorstep going, Jesus Christ, can I even park here? Because mm-hmm. it was, I thought it was really, really dangerous. So I, I did. I, I parked. There was a small inlet at that mm-hmm. sort of driveway. I parked there and went up and, and did the knock. But I just thought, no, you can't. This is one place you cannot stake out. I thought it was impossible to stake out. And I thought it was funny. You just, at the end, you just said, right, fuck it. And you went and well, stood the <laughs> sat in the wall. We did something that we never do where mm. we just said, yeah, fuck it. And um, we literally just sat. Um, basically by the wall in front and there's cctv cameras all over the place so i mean you're spotted straight away mm. so we weren't uh hiding so to speak but it kind of there was just a hope that mr butterley would eventually you know appear which is exactly what happened he just came around to the front of his house he got the shock of his life when he saw mick with the uh camera and uh yeah he kind of just darted straight into the house wouldn't answer any questions i went and rang the doorbell again didn't get any answers so he's keeping quiet at the moment um I think people are interested in what most Mr. Butterley has to say about this verdict mm-hmm. because he made a legal effort uh, through the High Court to try and have uh, unlawful killing um, be unavailable as a possible verdict for the jury. But he lost um, that particular legal challenge. And obviously, they, you know, we have gone on to decide that this was an unlawful killing back that that terrible fire in 1981 that killed all those people. Um the families now, you know, I mean, I spoke to Antoinette Keegan, for example, she lost two sisters in the fire. Uh, a lot of them don't want to talk about Mr. Butterley, um, but they felt that they got justice um, on the day that they finally feel that they've been believed. I think they're now working with the government in terms of um, what happens next. And we know that Gardaí are also examining the decision of this um, of this inquest and that there may be, uh, there exa- certainly the Garda Commissioner has directed senior officers to look at the possibility of whether or not there's a scope here for a criminal investigation. And if that's launched, I mean, that's got to be one of the biggest homicide investigations maybe in the history of the state if that happens. Um, so, I mean, they're, they're, this is a story that still isn't over. Let me ask you this, Paul. Um, when you did decide to go overt, shall we say, was that strange for you? Because when we're doing stakeouts, really our whole purpose is not to be seen. Yes. You, you know, you want to get, so you, you, you know, you try and skulk, yeah, scummy hacks. We skulk. So you were doing the exact opposite of that. Well, I, I, it's not, so, it's, as I said, it's not something we really do, but um, I just kind of felt like Mr. Butterley probably was not going to come out of his own accord. And, um, I, and look, I mean, it's not like we were standing right outside his front door, peering in the windows. We were mm-hmm. still a bit of a distance away. We were just standing within proximity of the front gate 
Uh, and because more importantly than me actually speaking to him was, I think, the photograph to show here he is still back at home. Um, I obviously hoped that he would speak to me. He decided not to. Um, but yeah, I think we had it on our front page on Saturday. And I know uh, a lot of the victims of, of the tragedy uh, still want him uh, to speak out and uh, you know they they still want answers as regards to what's happened at the fire mr bushley appeared well, i'm not going to go through all of the uh inquests because people are probably uh, quite familiar with it but mr Butley did appear as a witness uh throughout the uh the particular inquest and g- uh, gave evidence in his account um and he did insist because uh, there, there was a dispute over whether the doors were locked on the night um, and uh, whether he was being truthful about his account of what had happened. And he insisted that the doors were not locked and that he trusted his doormen. Um, and he disputed a lot of that narrative that the that the doors were locked and that people were, um, you know, un- unable to get out as a result. Back to the, the stakeouts, how long in your experience does it take neighbours or people in the area to spot your car when you're doing a stakeout? Five minutes. <laughs> yeah, it's, I always laugh when I see TV mm. TV dramas about cops on a stakeout or journalists on a stakeout. They've got huge big cameras and they're sitting there. So mm-hmm. Even the last two minutes in Ireland doing that. So it's so. Uh, have you ever had the guards called on you? Oh, uh, several times. Yeah. yeah. Usually, though, the guards they're quite casual about it. Once, I mean, just obviously, we tell them straight away what we're doing, yeah. and they kind. Of, yeah, there's usually a laugh and uh, okay, right, lads, carry on, you know, just but you are scaring the crap out of some of the 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 neighbors switching the curtains, you know. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, that's understandable, time, by the way. It is understandable. It's a strange it, it, car, it, of course, it is. I mean, look, I mean, I live on a, on a small street and it, uh, straight away, I can tell you within even yeah. 30, 30 seconds, if there is a strange car on our road, uh, I guarantee you that most of my neighbors know about it. Um, you know, and it's great to have neighbors like that, isn't it? You know, um, but like we don't mean any harm. Sometimes there are just people who go out of their way not to be seen. They don't want to get their photograph taken. That kind of drives me to get them even more. Mm -hmm. And as hot a day as it was on Friday, we stayed until we got them because we really wanted um, to make contact with Mr. Bushley um, and to to get that photograph. Um, we sweated buckets, but uh, yeah, we, we it was worth it. Hope you had an ice cream. <laughs> I didn't have no time for an ice cream. <laughs> There's no better feeling than when you get somebody when you've been sticking them out. Oh, it's great. It's mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's it's what it's all about at times, you know. And we Nick, we, we it, sorry, Nick ahead. and I did one that I think mean, was put up this for Nick and I did one in Southampton. It was it was for days, mm-hmm. and the cops came then, and they were all right, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we got, we were literally days there, right? Sitting in a rented Opal Zafira. God, it was so hot. And when we got him, it was 20 seconds. Mm-hmm. But it was great. What a rush. Oh, it's it's over in a second. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. uh, Mr. Mr. Bodley was straight back into his house and it was just a matter of seconds. I don't even know whether he heard us calling him. <laughs> he certainly saw the camera though. Uh, so... <laughs> um, but I, I, think, I think I spoke about this on the podcast before, but, you know, sometimes it can be really easy until it's not you know like I, I mean we were we went down myself and Mick to a job to try and get a co- convicted uh, sex offender pedophile he got a suspended sentence so we were tr- it was in this tiny rural town and we didn't really know where he, we had a rough idea where he lived but we didn't really know exactly where the house was we drove into the town he was the first person we saw standing across the road just like literally it was like that's fucking him <laughs> And I was like, oh, this is over. We get to turn around. And it was like a three-hour drive. I was like, we get him, we go home, happy days. Not so. Uh, he crossed the road. It was an extremely busy road. The logistics of it were impossible. Like, we're trying to park up. We mm. couldn't park up. By the time we'd managed to turn around, he'd crossed the road and gotten onto a bus that just pulled up, and he was gone. And like that, then we had... <laughs> we had to chase this bus. Um, I think it went to... Where did it go? God, it was, it was, it was, it went, it was a good half hour, 40 minutes following this bus. And then wherever we parked, we never saw him get off the bus. Mm-hmm. And we were like, what did, did we, did he get off somewhere else? Did we lose him? So we lost him, completely lost him. And then we basically just said to each other, the only thing left to do is to go back to our starting point and wait for him to come back. So what started off as such a simple job, as in saw him within the first 30 seconds of arrival, 
we then sat there, I think, for six or seven hours until he came home. Well, got off, came back and got off the bus and we got him then. But, but that's why you and I <laughs> and Mick, we always take two cars in a job because, yeah. you know, you literally, one person might have to stay there and you, the other fella could be driving around half the mm-hmm. county. So that's why two cars are important. because that, And that's just a technical thing that it just makes it easier. One two person can stay still. Yeah, two cars aren't always possible, but yes, ideally so, yes. Mm. But uh, I, 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 I often tell that story because it kind of just shows how, um, you know, how it's kind of nonsensical our job at times, but like, you know, we have to sometimes sit in cars for hours or even days mm. before we get somebody. But that rush... Then ah. when you finally do, uh, yeah, there's nothing like it. Yeah, it's brilliant. Okay, what's next on our agenda? Uh, we had a pull out last week. Um, yes, it was sorry, my, to pull it. Was, yeah, it was my idea. I wanted. To, I was speaking to Neil Leslie, the editor. I just wanted to talk about really what are the potential threats to Ireland. Um, so we did a pull out, and there were basically there's lots of threats. Now you know it could be anything from a Russian or an American invasion or whatever. And some of them are obviously hugely unlikely, but that doesn't mean that Ireland shouldn't have a level of defence where it can defend itself. We know that there was a commission on the defence forces 18 months ago, I think, where it said, at the minute, Ireland cannot defend itself. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole thing about invasion. That's grand. That won't be happening, hopefully. But mm-hmm. there are things, say, for example, policing. If you change, say, for you know, people talking about we don't have any jets, so we can't intercept Russian planes. What if you change that to, we don't have any facility to police our airspace? Or what if you change it to, if we only have one naval service ship out at a time, do we have the facility to police our seas? I interviewed Deputy Cahill Berry, former Ranger Wing uh, Deputy Commanding uh, Officer, Second in Command. Mm-hmm. And he was talking about, he said, it's, you know, if you put one ship, naval ship out, that's mana for the drug cartels. They will flood, they will come to Ireland massively because they know that the chances of stuff being intercepted in Ireland is smaller than if you go to the coast of uh, Spain or Portugal or North Africa, because they have better security infrastructure. And I, I think that's a very good point. That And you know, I know you, you know you did a piece about the drug seizures, and I, I monitor this. There has been a massive amount of drugs seized this year. It's well over 100 million. And there was a huge amount last year, even, you know, the... <sighs> The what's the, the, the big seizure the MV, of the coast? Matthew. MV Matthew. That was massive. But even before that, it was I think it was something like 190 million before mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. So if you think that you know experts differ, but anywhere between 10 and 40 percent of what is sent to, to Ireland is intercepted by law enforcement, customs and guardy. So between 60 and 90 percent gets through. And then yeah. So you know, say it's 250 million seized last year. That's hundreds of millions that gets through. Mm-hmm. And is and my worry, and one of the reasons for doing the pull, it is, is Ireland seen as an easy touch by international cartels? Mm-hmm. It, it certainly is. It obviously is. I mean, the proof, proof is in the pudding there, isn't it? You know, with those, but I mean, it's great the numbers that they seized last year. So it's showing mm-hmm. perhaps they're, maybe they're getting on top of it now, you know? Or it could be that there's more dr- stuff coming in. That's the well, that's the other the other option, which hopefully isn't the case. I thought was fascinating about those figures that, um, uh, that were given to us by revenue. Um, in um, they they particularly noted the fact that, um, and they gave us a comment on this. Uh, that that drugs are now coming in via the post, uh, yeah. in large numbers, and they're actually quite concerned about that. Um, it's kind of hard to imagine. Um. That that you know, that that that's happening on a large scale, but apparently it is, and it's very very difficult for them to even monitor the post. Yeah, so a lot of the the parcels, and whenever revenue release a statement, so I have a wee Anaraki Excel spreadsheet, mm. and it, they always say the the parcels came in from America, and they were destined for addresses in Athlone or Mullingar or, or or Dublin or whatever. So they know obviously with addresses they know where they're going, but I was struck by the number. Of it's terrible cannabis that is largely sent. And I was struck by the number of parcels that come from America. And some people would speculate that that's because there is a is there decriminalization in some American there is. states. Yeah. So maybe that's why. And Canada as well. Yeah. But think. it's not it's it's not really new because I remember a long, long time ago there was this drugs gang called the West, you know, with Southern Coats. Mm. So they were they were killed. Um in Catral in near Tarvie in, in Spain. And I remember doing a story about them sending drugs into Ireland by post. And obviously, you know, remember the whole John Gilligan was done yeah. for sending not 
cannabis, but it was in the uh, prescription medicines in the Ireland. So look, mm-hmm. years ago, I spoke to a senior drugs, uh, then GND, GNDU officer, and, and he basically said, criminals will do whatever they can to make money and they will find a way. And sending stuff in by post is finding another way of getting it in. I, 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 there you go. You're saying it's nothing new, but I just thought it was noteworthy that they particularly singled that out. So, I mean, that that is a major concern for them. Well, what what is interesting is that they are concerned about it. There has mm. been an exponential rise because I look at them, I'd, I'd say, you know, maybe six out of 10 are all are in parcels. You notice it because it says in a location in Dublin, or they would say, you know, in a location down the country. And it's right. Okay. These are definitely coming in. And, you know, I'd say easily majority of, significant or a majority of drug seizures have been parcels from from America and other places. Crazy. I just have the figures up here now. They mm. they, they told us uh, cocaine and heroin seizures are on the rise. 111 seizures last year uh, were 226.7 million. It's a huge figure. Uh, huge. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and and a lot of that was the MV Matthew, but as you said, mm. there's, there's still a, a significant number there outside of that um yeah 2513 seizures um uh, of cannabis smug- smuggled into Ireland through various means um there were 13.98 million in 2022 so yeah i mean huge figures incredible and there was a piece um listeners may know did you hear about that uh, criminal in france who escaped after Three prison officers were shot dead and two were injured. Or yes, that's a that was a big case. But that's like something was, straight out of uh, what's that TV show, the Gomorrah? That there's actually yeah, that oh, that, ex- that happens in that TV show. Yeah, and it was Matt. brazen and it was blatant and it was cruel and heartless, really. But what mm. it was a more contextual piece it talked about the rise of cocaine in Europe. He's a cocaine dealer, and mm. the rise in that high cocaine. Europe is now number one market for cocaine. Europeans, including Irish people, are spending 15 billion, 13 or 14 billion a year on cocaine. It's a massive, massive issue. It's a massive area of profit for the criminals and it's a massive area of concern for law enforcement. And they are getting more violent to protect themselves. Fascinating. Fascinating. Right. Shall we leave it there? I, you I have, have to get to a if, press I conference. If the Lieutenant General got this top gig. <laughs> okay. I'll let you go. Uh, thanks as ever to our listeners. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, everybody.